I welcome everyone tonight in Jesus' name. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for gathering us together and out your word. And we're asking, O oh Lord, that your spirit will take the word tonight. Make it life and spirit to everyone in Jesus' name. And any kind of fear, any kind of intimidation, any kind of problem, opposition that may be confronting any of your people, I pray, Lord, you drive them away in Jesus' name. Speak to everyone tonight that it is I be not afraid. And confirm your word in every heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Tonight we're coming to Mark chapter 6, verse 45, all through to verse 56. Let's read some of the verses together. In verse 45, Mark chapter 6. And straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the sheep. And to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida, while he sent away the people. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when even, that is when the evening was come, the sheep was in the midst of the sea. And he alone on the land. And he saw them toiling in rowing. For the wind was contrary unto them. And about the first watch of the night, he cometh unto them walking upon the sea. And would have passed by them. But when they saw him, walking upon the sea. They supposed it had been a spirit and cried out. For they all saw him and they were troubled and immediately he talked with them and says unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And he went up unto them into the ship, and the wind ceased, the wind must stop. And they were so amazed in themselves beyond measure, and wondered, verse 56, and whithersoever he entered into villages or cities or country, they laid the sick in the streets and besought him that they might touch if it were but the border of his garment. And as many as touched him were made whole. Any amen over there? As we have read the verses that you have heard, you have seen some peculiar, specific things that Christ did. And what he said, actually, Christ proved himself to be unique in power, unique in performance, and unique in operation. That means he did what no other person ever did. That came before him, and he said, what no other person ever said that came before him. We must always hold that uniqueness of the Lord in our heart that he can do as he always did what other people have never done and that he says what other people have never said. Tonight, the message is titled, Christ's Prevailing Power and our unwavering faith, Christ's prevailing power, and our unwavering faith. A sea is full of power, 
and his name means power. His authority means power. His message communicates power unto us. His ministry makes power to come into our lives. We must have unwavering faith. Christ's prevailing power and our unwavering faith. As we look at Mark chapter 6 tonight, there are three things we're looking at as we divide the verses. So three parts. Number one, his conquering power over uncommon tempests. His conquering power over uncom uncommon tempests. Number two, our causeless panic with unnecessary torment. The panic, the fear, the fright, the anxiety, the worry that we manifest unnecessarily. Our causeless panic with unnecessary torment. Number three, the compassionate people with unwavering trust. As they saw him come to their community, they went everywhere, bringing people who have needs in their lives, bringing them to Christ. They were compassionate. They were considerate. They were sympathetic. And when they saw Jesus, the solution to every problem, they went forth and brought all the people to him because they had unwavering trust in him. The compassionate people with unwavering trust. Point number one now is conquering power over uncommon tempest. Look at verse 45 again. Mark chapter 6, reading from verse 45. And straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the sheep and to go to the other side. You may want to underline that in your Bible, to go to the other side. We need to understand and need to remember that whatever Jesus says will come to pass. Heaven and earth may pass away, but his word shall never pass away. And since he said, go to the other side, he went apart to go and pray, I'll meet you on the other side, he must meet you on the other side. Nothing will cut short the journey before you get to the other side. Nothing will destroy your life before you get to the other side. Always hold his word in mind. He said, go to the other side before unto Beth Bethsaida, while he sent away the people. And when he has sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. That's the Son of God, our Lord and Savior. He has left a perfect example for us. Live a life of prayer. Before service, pray. After the service, pray. Before duty, pray. After the duty, pray. Before any performance, pray. After that performance, pray. Verse 47, And when evening was come, the sheep was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And he saw them toiling in rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. But please remember, the wind contrary is not going to take anything away from their life. They must still get to the other side. I must still get to the other side. And about the first watch of the night, that between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. early in the morning, he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. And when they saw him, it says, walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit, 
and they cried out. But he conquered the tempest. He conquered the storm. He walked on the stormy sea. He's conquering power over uncommon tempests. We'll see three things there. Number one is personal prayer. His personal prayer. He depended so much upon the Father. He depended so much upon God. He prayed all the time. His personal prayer. Number two, we'll see his prevailing power over the sea, over the storm, over any challenge and every challenge. His prevailing power. Number three, our promised privilege. Our promised privilege. Look at number one there. That is his personal prayer. We're reading here from verse 46. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. That was a lifeline. That was the reason and the basis and the foundation of his constant power. He prayed. He prayed. Tells us in Mark chapter 1, verse 35. Mark chapter 1, verse 35. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place where he could have quietness, where he could pray and talk to the Father without any distraction. He departed into a solitary place and there prayed. And there prayed his personal prayer. And that's an example for you and for me that our lives should be marked with praying. Praying every time. Praying without ceasing. Praying with faith, with a wavering faith. Never allowing any day to pass without waiting upon the Lord and praying. Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. I'm reading from verse 1. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray like he did. Always to pray like they saw him always praying, and not to faint, saying, there was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city. And she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, for a time, for a season, but afterward, he said within himself, though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by a continual coming she weary me. Here the Lord told this parable to make us understand importunity in prayer is important. Constancy in prayer is important. Continuity in prayer is important. We shouldn't um, miss our privilege of praying, thinking, I've asked, I've not received, ask again. I've demanded, I've not got, demand it again. I held on to the promises I didn't receive, keep on holding to the promise. And the Lord said in verse 6, here, watch, the unjust judge says, And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night, which pray day and night, which intercede, pray day and night before him, though he bear long of them, I tell you, that he will avenge them speedily. He will avenge them speedily. 
the Lord will answer your prayer in Jesus' name. Luke chapter 21, verse 36. Luke chapter 21, verse 36. Watch it therefore and pray always. Don't just pray occasionally. When the water is almost drowning you, don't just pray once in a while. When it appears you are driven to the wall, always. When you are happy, pray, thank him. When it's a challenge, pray and demand solution and answer from him. When there is any problem, pray. He has solution to every problem. Watch ye therefore, and pray always that she may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Pray always, pray daily, pray without ceasing. The second thing here is this prevailing inner power. We're coming to Mark chapter 6, Verse 47, his prevailing inner power. And when evening was come, the sheep was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And he saw them toiling in rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. When the wind is contrary unto you, don't look at the wind. Look at your Christ. Look at your Savior. He will uphold you. He will strengthen you. He will carry you through in Jesus' name. Our problem is we look too much to the wind, at the wind. Too much at the contrary circumstances. Too much at the frowning face of an opposer. We look too much and the circumstances around us. The wind was contrary unto them. About the fourth watch of the night, he comes unto them. He wasn't looking at the wind. He wasn't thinking of the wind. The contrary wind was not going to de determine his destiny. The contrary wind was not going to determine his decisions. And then he says, walking upon the sea. You'll walk upon the sea. He that believeth on me, the works that I do, he shall do. As he walked on the sea, so will you walk on your stormy sea. And would have passed them by. Then if you look at Psalm 93, I'm looking at Psalm 93, and we're reading from verse 3. Psalm 93, verse 3. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their voice. The Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters. You didn't hear that one. The Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters, yea, than the mighty waters of the sea. The Lord will see you through. Psalm 104. We're looking at verse 3. Psalm 104, verse 3. Who lays the beams of his chambers in the waters? Who maketh the clouds his chariot? Who walketh upon the wings of the wind? That's our God. That's our Savior. That's our Lord. He walketh upon the wings of the wind. And he tells us, if we will pray, answers will come. Miracle will come. That's a privilege, our promised privilege. Our promised privilege. Jesus walked on the storm. 
you will walk on the storms of life. Whatever storm is raging at this time, as you follow Jesus and we look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith will walk through the contrary wind, will get to the other side. Matthew chapter 14. In Matthew chapter 14, our promised privilege. And straightway, verse 27, Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is high, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, if that's you, my Savior, Lord, if it be thou, that perfect example, Lord, if it be thou, my master, my king, my lord, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. Bid me come unto thee on the water. You will do it. I said you will do it. Contrary wind, bad situation, stormy sea or tempest, you will ride on that tempest. And you will make progress through that tempest in Jesus' name. Bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, don't come. And he said, he didn't say, Peter, that's too pushful, don't come. Peter, that's looking too high, don't come. Peter, don't think you can do everything I do. Don't come. You're welcome. And he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, tell me, tell me, tell me out aloud, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. The Lord will calm your storm. Psalm 107. I'm reading from verse 27. Psalm 107. Verse 27. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and I at the weed's end, then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distresses. Bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm a calm. I'm going to read that again. He maketh your storm a calm so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad because they be quiet. That tempest will be calmed in your life. So he bringeth them unto their desired heaven. He bringeth them unto their desired heaven from tonight. You are entering your place of quiet and rest in Jesus' name. Point number two now, our causeless panic with unnecessary torment. We're coming to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 49. Mark chapter 6 verse 49. But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit. They supposed it had been a spirit. Many times we get into trouble because of our supposition. I see that uh, person and I look at his posture, I look at his body language, and because of my supposition, I make a conclusion. And it's the conclusion that troubles me. It's not the person. 
It's not his body language. It's not what he does. It's your own interpretation, your own supposition. They supposed it had been a spirit. We we'll see a situation in our lives, and we we'll see something happening, and we do not know this in the Lord Himself, and we suppose this must be Satan. We suppose it's an evil spirit. We suppose it's an enemy. And because of our supposition, we're troubled, and then we begin to cry. We even lose our appetite, and we go on compulsory fasting. Because they supposed it had been a spirit, they cried out. For they all saw him, and they were troubled. They saw loving Jesus, and they were troubled. They saw their own Savior, and they were troubled. They saw their friend, and they were troubled. And they saw the one that the Father sent to them, to take them to the other side and to take them to heaven. And they were troubled. He wasn't the cause of their trouble. Their supposition was the cause of their trouble. How many times in our lives, as we look at things happening, and we look at actions and activities of people, and then we think, we suppose, that this is what is going on, then we become afraid. Your fears will be cancelled in Jesus' name. But you all saw him, and you were afraid, and immediately talked with them, and says unto them, be of good cheer, change your mind, change your thinking, turn away from that supposition, be of good cheer. It is I be not afraid. It is I be not afraid. Have you heard? I said, did you hear? You will not be afraid in Jesus' name. We're looking at First John chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 18. First John chapter 4, verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Christ loved them perfectly. That's why he came to save them. God loves them perfectly. That's why he sent his only begotten son to save them. And God loves us perfectly with an everlasting love. That's why he has sent his son to us. He has sent his Holy Spirit to us. He has sent the word unto us. Be of good cheer. Be not afraid. Because fear has torment. He that, is, he that feareth is not made perfect in love. I said this point is our causeless panic. The panic that ought not to be. The fear that ought not to be. Our causeless panic and unnecessary fear. We're looking at Psalm 53. And I'm reading from verse 5. Psalm 53 we're reading from verse 5. It says, There were they in great fear where no fear was. No reason for the fear, no root for the fear, and no consequence even of the fear where no fear was. There were they in great fear. Let me show you some illustrations. We're looking at 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. In great fear when the fear is unnecessary. In great fear when the fear is costless. 
in 2 Kings chapter 6, reading from verse 14. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 14. Therefore sent he hither, thither horses and chariots and a great host, and they came by night, and they compassed the city about. That's the king of Syria sending chariots, horses, soldiers around the city where Elisha was. He did that by night. And so when they woke up in the morning, they were already on attention there. Verse 15, and when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And he and his servant said, Alas, my master, how shall we do? Panic, fear, torment, because of what he saw. The Lord will open our eyes. Verse 16, and he answered, fear not. Elisha saw what he didn't see. He only saw the physical. He only saw the chariots and the horses coming from the king of Syria. Elisha saw beyond. You will see beyond. You see the prince of peace. You see the prince of power. You'll see the Lord Jesus Christ, all the costless panic in your life will vanish away in Jesus' name. And he said, fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. You believe that? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They that be with us. He that is with you is greater than he that's in the world in Jesus' name. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw, and he saw, I will see. And he saw, I said, I will see. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. All those uh, chariots of, and horses of fire around you, they will not allow the enemy to get near in Jesus' name. Uh, let me show you something very important. Please pay attention. In Deuteronomy chapter 2, Deuteronomy chapter 2, actually Deuteronomy chapter, the whole of Deuteronomy is a repetition of the history of the children of Israel since they came out of Egypt until the time they almost entered into the land of Canaan. And now as Moses rehearsed the history, he gives us revelation that if the people who were afraid, if they had heard they would not have been afraid. Look at this, Deut Deuteronomy chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 8, and I'm reading from verse 9. Chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. It says, and when we passed this past tense, it's, re it's recounting the history of the children of Israel. And when we pass by from our brethren, the children of Esau, which dwelt in Seir through the way of the plain from Elam and from Ezion Gaba. We turned and passed by the way of the wilderness of Moab. Think about that. We passed by the way of the wilderness of Moab. Verse 9, and the Lord said unto me, and the Lord said unto me, Distress not the Moabites. Distress not the Moabites. Neither contend with them in battle. Look at Moab. Don't touch them. Don't contend with them. Don't fight them. Don't distress them. 
for I will not give thee their land for a possession. Israel, I will give you your own land in another place, land of Canaan. For the Moabites, don't get near them, don't distress them, and don't do anything negative to them because I have given I unto the children of Lord for a possession. They were the children of Lord, and I've given them that land. Don't touch their land. Look at verse 19, that same chapter 2, verse 19. It says, And when thou comest nice over against the children of Ammon, distress them not, nor meddle with them. For I will not give thee the land of the land of the children of Ammon any possession, because I have given each unto the children of Lot for, the, for a possession. Moab and Ammon were children of Lot, and their descendants were the Moabites and the Ammonites. And as the children of Israel were passing through, the Lord said, don't touch their land, don't distress them, and don't do anything negative to them. I will not give you their land. But now, let's see what happened. Numbers chapter 22. What we read in Deuteronomy actually took place before this time, because as I told you, as a recounting of the history of the children of Israel you have in Deuteronomy. But now, Numbers chapter 22, verse 3. And Moab was so afraid, unnecessary fear. Moab was so, so afraid, terribly afraid. Moab did not know that God had told the children of Israel, don't touch their land, don't fight with them. Don't distress them. I'm giving them their land. I'm not going to give you any possession of their land. Moab was ignorant of that. And because of that ignorance, there was causeless panic, unnecessary fear, unnecessary torment. Verse 3, and Moab was so afraid of the people because they were many. And Moab was distressed. His own supposition distressed him. His own assumption distressed him. It wasn't God distressing them, not the children of Israel distressing them. It was what they supposed might happen. It says Moab was distressed because of the children of Israel. And Moab said unto the elders of Midian, Now shall this company lick up all that around about us. No, not at all. They couldn't do that. The Lord had warned Moses and had told Moses, and Moses were obeyed, that they shouldn't touch the land of the Moabites. But he said they would lick us up as the ox licketh up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was, uh, was king of the Moabites at that time. And he sent messengers, therefore, unto Balaam, the son of Baal, and to Pethel, which is by the river of the land of the children of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, there is a people come out from Egypt. Behold, they cover the face of the earth. And they abide over against me, against me. They want to fight against me. I can see them preparing. They're going to lick up the land. No, not at all. This is your supposition. Unnecessary panic, causeless panic. Come now, therefore. I pray thee, cause me this people. For they are too mighty for me. By adventure, I shall prevail that we may smite them 
and I may drive them out of the land. For I what I know that he whom thou blessest is blessed, and he whom thou causest is cursed. You see that? It was unnecessary. And there wasn't any sin warranting their calling Balaam. Your property is secured. The Lord is going to protect you. And he's going to protect your family. And he's going to protect everything you have. We don't need to panic and be afraid. If I don't do something now, what are you doing something about? The Almighty God has already some, done something about that. No evil hand will touch you. That's why eventually because of that fear, because of that panic, that's why Balak sent for Balaam because of personal torment, self-imposed torment, self-imposed distress. That's why he sent for them. And then Balaam came for the errand. Deuteronomy chapter 23. Deuteronomy 23, I'm reading here from verse 3. An Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Why? Because of the unnecessary fear that made them to call Balaam to come and curse the people of God. Unnecessary panic, causeless panic that led them to confusion, that led them to conflict, that led them to unnecessary fight because of the torment of their supposition. And eventually now the Lord said, because they, I was trying to protect them, defending them. And I told Israel already, don't destroy them, don't touch their land. And they went forth to do what they shouldn't do. And they wanted to destroy Israel while I was protecting them. An Ammonite, a Moabite, shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord, even to the tenth generation. Shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord forever? Because this is not the will of God. This is their own making because they met you not with bread and with water in the way. When ye came forth out of Egypt, and because they hired against thee, Balaam, they shouldn't have done that. Nothing to fear. And yet they were unnecessarily afraid, and they hired Balaam because of hiring Balaam. When they shouldn't have done that, they will not enter into the congregation of the Lord. They hired Balaam, the son of Baal, of Pesel, of Mesopotamia, to cause thee. Nevertheless, the Lord thy God will not hearken unto Balaam. The Lord thy God will not hearken unto Balaam. The curse, costless, shall not come. The yoke, costless, shall not come. The oppression, costless, shall not come. Here the children of Israel were going on. And they were not going to touch Moab or Ammon. And they were going to respect their property and their person. They had no intention of doing any evil to them. And therefore, there should be no fear. And then they went to pay a large amount of money. They promised they were going to put in the coffers of Balaam just to destroy those people. Nobody will destroy you. Nevertheless, the Lord thy God will not hack in unto Balaam. But the Lord thy God turned... Tell me. The Lord thy God, tell me. Are you not excited about what the Lord is doing for you? Tell me. Turn the curse into a blessing unto thee. 
because the Lord thy God loves thee. Amen. I said, Amen. Isaiah chapter 51. I'm reading from verse 7. Isaiah chapter 51, verse 7. Hearken unto me, ye that know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law, fear ye not. Fear ye not. Fear ye not the reproach of men, neither be ye afraid of their revilings. Look at verse 12. I, even I, am he that comforteth you, who art thou that thou shouldest be afraid of a man, a man that shall die, and of the son of man, which shall be made as grass, and forgettest the Lord thy maker, that has stretched forth the heavens and laid the foundation of the earth, and has feared continually, feared continually, feared continually every day because of the fury of the oppressor, as if he were ready to destroy. And where is the fury of the oppressor? Nowhere to be found. The Lord is on your side, and the Lord will help you, and the Lord will protect you, and all those threats will come to nothing in Jesus' name. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject unto bondage. You will not be in bondage anymore in Jesus' name. Hebrews chapter 13 Verse 5, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness. Be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Verse 6, everybody, one, two, three, go. Emphasize my, emphasize me. One, two, three, go. And emphasize is at the present moment, today, today, in your present life, he is your helper. Verse 6, 1, 2, 3, go. The Lord is your helper. The Lord is your supplier. The Lord is your provider. The Lord is your support. The Lord is your protection. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. It is I, be not afraid. Be not afraid. Be not afraid. Fear is cancelled out of your life in Jesus' name. Point number three now, the compassionate people with unwavering trust. Look at chapter 6 of Mark. I'm reading from verse 53. 
Mark chapter 6, verse 53. And when they had passed over, you see that? They got to the other side eventually. It will happen. I said it will happen. Everything the Lord has said about you will happen. Every promise the Lord has given you will be fulfilled. Every place the Lord has ordained you will get to, you will get there in Jesus' name. And when they had passed over, they came into the land of Genesaret and drew unto the shore. And when they that were come out of the sheep straightway, they knew him. They knew him. They knew him. They knew he has come. And tonight he has come. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I will be in the midst of them. They knew him. The Redeemer has come. They knew him. The Savior has come. They knew him. The Healer has come. They knew him. The Deliverer has come. They knew him. The one that never lost any battle has come. They knew him. The solution to every problem has come. As you are today, you will know he's there by your side. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And he has given you his name. And whatever you ask in that name tonight, he has done it already. Look at verse 55. And they ran through that whole region round about and began to carry about in beds those that were sick. Where? They heard he was, and whithersoever he entered, whithersoever he entered, he has entered our church auditorium. He came here, he got here before you came. He got here before you sat down there, and he's waiting for you to call upon him. He will do it. In your life, I said he will do it. And whithersoever, whithersoever any location, Whithersoever any city, whithersoever any village, whithersoever, everywhere we're hearing the word of God now, whithersoever he entered into villages or cities or country, they laid the sick in the streets and besought him that they might touch if it were the border of his garment. Look at this. And as many as touched him, and as many as touched him, and as many as touched him, can you touch him today? Will you touch him today? Can the whole church touch him today? Can the incurable touch him today? Can the sick one touch him today? Can the oppressed touch him today? Can the people that have any cause in their lives, can they touch him today? Is he partial? Will he answer you? As many as touched him, as many as touched him, as many as touched him, tonight is my night. I will touch him. I will touch him. I will touch him. As many as touched him were made whole. In your spirit, made whole. In your heart, made whole. In your mind, made whole. In your brain, made whole. In your blood system, made you whole. In your body, made whole. In your spiritual life, made whole. Rise up and touch him. Rise up and touch him. As many, as many, as many as touched him were made whole, complete, perfect, healed, delivered, set free. Open your mouth and pray to the Lord today. A wavering faith, a wavering trust, a wavering confidence, a wavering dependence on him, touch him and be made whole. His Savior, touch him and be saved. His sanctifier, touch him and be sanctified. Is deliverer, touch him and be delivered. It's the one that cast out every form of fear. Touch him and be fearless. Fearless in your soul. Fearless in your mind. 
there is nothing, absolutely nothing to fear. Unnecessary fear. Unwarranted fear. Causeless fear. They have the fears away. How are you going to fear a fellow believer? There's nothing to fear in a fellow believer. Are you going to fear an unbeliever? There's nothing to fear in an unbeliever. The Lord has warned them. Don't touch my son. Don't touch my daughter. What if they don't hear? What if they don't know? What if they still go ahead to hire Balaam? He'll turn their curse into blessing. He'll turn their threats into your testimony. He'll turn their evil into your good. Supposition. They supposed it had been a spirit. Supposition. That's what is killing many people. Supposition. Supposition. I suppose they hate me. I suppose they are working against me. I suppose they want to torture me. You are torturing yourself. Cast away all that supposition. It is I be not afraid. You will walk on the storms of life. You will trudge upon the enemy. You fly over every mountain and you cross every sea. You are coming to the other side. No fear. No panic. No torment. Fear has torment. Stop tormenting yourself. Don't destroy yourself by fear. Don't detach yourself from the Savior because of fear. Fear causes depression. Fear causes panic. Fear causes confusion. Fear causes wrong action. Fear causes running away from your blessing. Supposition. Wrong thinking. Fear. Therefore, we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Touch is virtue. Touch is promise. He has not changed the same yesterday, today, and forever. Touch him and be made whole. In your soul, in your spirit, in your body, every area of your life, touch him and be transformed. His power remains the same today. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. He did what no other man ever did. He said, what no other man ever said. Trust him. He cannot fail. Faithful is he that calleth you. 
who also will do it. Faithful is he that has called you, who also 